Welcome to the 25th Distinguished Statistician Colloquium sponsored by Pfizer, American Statistical Association, and University of Connecticut. I am Dr. Deepak Day, Yukon Board of Trustees, Distinguished Professor of Statistics. Thank you all for joining us today. As your master of ceremonies, I will be guiding you through the program. I am joined on screen by our distinguished honorary, Dr. Nan Laird, the Harvey V. Feinberg Professor Emerita of Biostatistics at Harvard University, D.H. Chan School of Public Health, and our accomplished interviewers, Dr. Joe Hogan, and the Carol and Lawrence Sirovich Professor of Public Health and Professor of Biostatistics at Brown University, as well as Dr. Christoph Lang, Professor of Biostatistics at Harvard University, T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and Assistant Professor of Medicine at Harvard Medical School. I am delighted they are here. Dr. Hogan and Dr. Lang will be interviewed, Dr. Laird, in the later portion of our program. For now, I will ask them all to please head backstage by turning off your cameras and muting your microphones. Dr. Laird will be back in a few moments, but first I would like to thank our sponsor again, Pfizer ASA and Yukon. We are grateful for their generous support. Now let me address a few housekeeping items. There will be two opportunities for you, our audience, to submit questions. First, during Dr. Laird's lecture, and the second opportunity will be during the interview segment, where Dr. Hogan and Dr. Lang will be interviewing Dr. Laird. Please submit questions to us by using the questions tab at the top left of the main program screen. Some of you may have already submitted questions during the registration process. We will be addressing those during one of these opportunities. Our interviewers will be monitoring the questions and will do their best to incorporate them into the two different Q&A periods. If there are any unanswered questions, we will follow up with you afterwards. At this point, I am delighted to share a brief introduction of Dr. Laird's extremely distinguished career. Nan Mackenzie Laird, PhD, is the Harvey V. Feinberg Professor Emerita of Biostatistics at the Harvard T. H. Chan School of Public Health. She is widely recognized as a leading biostatistician and has received many awards. Recognizing her contribution to statistical and biostatistical research including the Samuel S. Wilkes Award, the F. N. David Award, and the Janet Norwood Award. She has over 300 publications in scholarly journals and is listed as highly cited by the web of science. She is especially noted for path-breaking work in incomplete data, meta-analysis, longitudinal analysis, and genetic analysis of familial data. In addition to research, she is a, a noted educator and author of two popular books, Applied Longitudinal Analysis with Garrett Fitzmaurice and Jim Ware, and The Fundamentals of Modern Statistical Genetics with Christoph Lang. She served as chair of the Department of Biostatistics at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health for nine years, during which time 
the department underwent substantial growth in faculty space and resources. She was a member of the influential subcommittee of the National Academy of Sciences on air cabin quality, which recommended the elimination of smoking in airplane cabins, leading to the current ban on smoking in airlines. She was also the lead statistician on a New York State hospital survey to enumerate the rates of adverse event of hospitalized patients and the associated costs, leading to revised guidelines for adverse event compensation. Now let, without further ado, uh, let me invite back and our honored speaker, Dr. Nan M. Laird, to make a few remarks before her keynote lecture. Thank you so much, Deepak, for that lovely introduction. It's really a delight for me to be here with you today and with Joe and with Christoph. And it's a special honor for me to give the 25th Distinguished Statistician Colloquium presentation today. And I do want to add that um, because of the pandemic, although we speak as if we are here together, in fact, we're only virtually here, otherwise we be wearing our masks. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much. Lovely remarks, Dan. We are looking forward to your keynote lecture. Let's enjoy that now. So in thinking about what I wanted to talk to you about today, I realized that there's one feature of my work over the past 45 years that I think is a bit of a trademark for me. And that is I'm often presented with solving a problem concerning a specific relatively small application. And in rather than solve that particular problem, I always seek to put that in a more general context and then solve the more general problem. And uh, so what I'm gonna talk to you about today is several instances of that, which illustrate going from a specific case to a more general case. And then my subtitle is Notation is Everything. So I, I put that as a subtitle because I do genuinely feel that the notation you use can have a strong influence on the ability of your audience to follow what you're saying. But also, I was very struck by the slide that announces the colloquium. So when I first looked at this slide, the thing that struck me immediately is my name has been replaced by an equation. And I thought, well, gee, if uh, in my old age, my name is replaced by an equation, you better be certain that that equation has the right notation in it. So that's another feature that I'll be stressing in my talk today is the importance of notation. Oh, sorry. So some of you may recognize that this equation comes from a paper that was written by myself and Art Yemster and Don Rubin in 1977 on the EM algorithm for incomplete data. It's not important that you recognize the equation or not. We'll discuss this a bit more, but many of you will probably not notice that the notation in this equation is not the same notation that appeared in the original article. So rather the notation in that equation comes from a Wikipedia article on the EM algorithm. Now, in, in the Wikipedia EM entry, it appears as part of a series on machine learning and data mining, which is applicable when you have unobservable 
latent variables. And I think that explains their choice, their decision to use a different notation from the original notation. So the notation that they used was that X denotes a vector of observed data and Z denotes a vector of latent variables. The latent variables in this case are often hypothesized, they're not observed, and they could be intrinsically unobservable. And another feature of the latent variables is that um, they are discrete. So a simple example that's always given uh, or often given when talking about this classification problem is imagine that you set out to measure height, weight, and other anthropometric variables such as risk circumference on a population of individuals, but you didn't manage to obtain their sex. Well, their sex is going to influence those variables considerably. And the question becomes whether or not can you recover an individual's sex by looking at these variables. So you start with the variables and ask, can you identify two underlying latent classes? Theta is the vector of model parameters here and the complete data would be um, denoted by both X and Z, the observed data, and the latent data. And then the distribution of the complete data is, uh, is chosen to be easy to maximize. Now, the original notation is a bit different from the Wikipedia notation, and I think considerably more general than the Wikipedia notation which is the reason that we introduced it that way in the original article. Uh, and as I said, this appeared originally in the Dempster, Laird and Rubin paper in 1997. So we denoted the observed data as the Y, which we call in the paper, the incomplete data. Now this, is, this use of the term incomplete data sometimes baffles people because they think, well, if you observe the data, why is it incomplete? Well, the notion that underlies the EM algorithm is that the data that you observe can be connected to a conceptual, possibly a conceptual set of complete data. And there are many different ways that you might define the complete data. I tend to think of the complete data as just all of the data that you might want to have in order to make your estimation prob problem easy to do. So we denote the complete data by X and Y, the data that are actually observed, is going to be included as part of X and there exists a mapping from X onto the observed data y. And this mapping doesn't have to be, uh, sorry, the complete data do not have to be unique uh, or the mapping, but only the observed data and the distribution of the observed data are unique. So I want to give you now an application of the EM. I'll give you several applications where I point out some of the differences in the way that you can structure the problems. Um, the EM algorithm, I think, is most obvious in the context of missing data. And missing data is a very ubiquitous problem in science and often difficult for people to decide how to handle missing data. So in the context of missing data, I think of the complete data denoted by X as the target of data collection. So this could be a sample survey where you set out to measure a number of variables on a number of individuals. It could be an experiment. It could be a um, follow-up study where you're measuring individuals repeatedly over time. But often you fail to, to uh, can, uh, 
you fail to collect a complete set of observations that you planned originally. And so the observations that you actually obtain are considered to be the incomplete data or the observed data. And the distribution of the observed data is just the ordinary marginal of the distribution of the complete data, but it can be awkward to maximize that marginal distribution because different subjects have different amounts of information. Now in this setting, the, the EM algorithm has been proposed prior to Dempster, Laird and Rubin, and it can also be extended to censoring and truncation. Now in this setting, uh, you might think of the missing data as are they're not generally latent. They're actual variables that you intended to collect, but for some reason or another, you were unable to collect a complete set of data. However, you can introduce more complicated models that are of interest, for example, if you're looking at how patients uh, fare on a treatment and you're taking repeated measurements over time of the outcome of interest, if a patient drops off of the treatment, then your, your variable that you would like to collect, namely, what is the outcome if that patient had remained on treatment to the end of the study becomes a latent variable. So a second application, which um, is commonly uses the EM algorithm is one that I worked on with Art Dempster as a graduate student, and that is variance components or random effects. <clears throat> and these variance components and random effects are very popular in animal breeding studies, uh, in selection, in uh, estimation of genetic heritability. And like the case of the latent variables, the observed data and the random effects are distinct, but both of them are included in the complete data. So it's very similar to the classification problem in many senses, but the random effects are continuous variables not discrete, and you need to estimate the variance components. So here, the outcomes that we actually observe can, is often represented as a sum of the random effects. So what that means is that the distribution of the complete data will be overdetermined, uh, although that doesn't affect one's ability to use the EM algorithm in most settings. Now, the heritability estimation is an example of this, where we might be looking at height, for example, and we want to know, well, how much of the variation in height from person to person can be explained by genetics and how much is due to environmental quantities. So your random effects are the underlying genetic component and the environmental components, and the outcome is the height, and one can think of the uh, outcome as being incomplete data. And if one were to have the genetic data and in the environmental data, it would be much more straightforward to estimate these variance components. So the uh, final application, the EM algorithm that I'll talk about is that's a broad application used a lot in engineering and med especially medical and health engineering. And that involves the use of indirect measurements. So one example of that is uh, also called image reconstruction. And uh, it's an example is in positron emission tomography or in PET scans. So in this setting, you're trying to estimate something like blood flow or change in metabolism in the brain or a different area of the body. Those things cannot be measured directly, but they can be um, indirectly measured using radioactive substances. So the EM algorithm has been used 
to reconstruct positron emission tomography images. The example that I wanna to talk to you about, I think it's a little easy to comprehend, and that is measuring particle sizes in a volume of aerosol. And this problem was presented to me by a student in environmental sciences. He was interested in measuring the amount of radon gas in a volume of air. Now, radon is a odorless, colorless, uh, aerosol and it is also poisonous. It, it is dangerous to one's lungs and thought to uh, put one at higher risk of lung cancer. So it's important to be able to measure the amount of radon in a volume of air. Now, a signature of aerosols or particles is the size. So at one extreme, dust has very large particles. You can actually see them with the eye. At the other extreme is radon, which has extremely small particle sizes. And, and so in order to estimate the, the amount of radon in the air, you need to be looking at the particle size distribution. Now, you cannot measure particles directly, but you can count them. And that's the principle that's used in the screen type diffusion battery or sometimes called a classifier. So this is a very simple device. It's just a stainless steel cylinder and it has a number of openings in it. These are called ports. So C0, C1, and this up to C5, but it could have any number of ports. And it draws in a volume of air and you will open only one port at a time. So this first port, if that's open, there's no size classification. And it will, this C0 will simply give you the count of the total number of particles in the volume of air. Then you put in another volume of air and you, the particles have to pass through a very fine mesh screen. And because radon particles are very small, they're moving very fast. And the speed at which they're moving around determines the probability that they will not get trapped by this screen and pass through and exit through the second opening. And then you can close these openings and look at the third one. And here, here you have several screens. The general principle being is that these screens trap particles with differential probability, depending upon the size of the, the particles. And so um, at each time you can count the number of particles coming through, but these particles have been size classified and furthermore, we know the mathematical equations underlying this telling us that what's the probability that a particle of a given size will pass out and, and in, <clears throat> exit out at a particular port. So th these are the observed data. These are the total counts at each of the ports. But what we really want to know is if you could, if you can, construct size categories, you like to know the number of particles in each of the size categories. So you use that to develop your idea of complete data. So I, we considered the complete data in this setting to be a two-dimensional array of counts. And so we're going to classify, so the counts in the cell are all the possible counts that you could have observed. And so they represent the number of counts in a particular size category. So this would be size category one, for instance, and which exited either at the zero point or the one point or the pth point. So these are all of the possible counts that you could have observed in the experiment. And of course you don't observe them, but the reason why they're useful is 
it's easy to uh, demonstrate that each one of these counts is independent and they follow a Poisson distribution and it's easy to calculate the mean of the counts. So it's very simple to write down the complete data likelihood, which is just a function of the probabilities underlying these cell classifications and, and these probabilities that cells of different sizes exit through different ports. So here's the complete data. What you observe is the row totals, that's the total counts, but what you actually want is these counts down here. And once you have these counts, you can say what proportion of the distribution is com composed of particles of all the different sizes of interest. Um, so the reason that you use these cell counts is simply that it makes the problem much easier. But all you really need to augment the data are these uh, column counts to augment the row counts. So I'm going to set aside just for a moment or two the uh, EM algorithm, although we tend to come back to the EM algorithm in many of the work that I work I've done. Uh, and I want to talk about my work uh, on longitudinal data analysis. This is work that I was very privileged to do with Jim Weir and Garrett Fitzmaurice over many years. And not only Jim and Garrett, but many other wonderful colleagues and uh, students. And the motivating example for this work was a looking at the effects of air pollution on children's growth. And this was uh, a study that Jim was in charge of analyzing. And it was a study that had been designed actually before he came to the School of Public Health by faculty in the Department of uh, uh, Environmental Health. And they had a hypothesis that uh, children's lung function should be impaired if they live in cities that have low air quality. And those cities, uh, those children who grow up in cities of higher air quality should have a better lung function. So they designed a longitudinal study to look at growth and lung function in children. There were other parts of the study, for example, looking at the decline in lung function and aging, but we focused mainly on growth in children. And this is sometimes called the Harvard Six City Study because it, um, the design of the study was to select six studies that had varying levels of air pollution at the beginning of the study. Then children in these six studies were enrolled through their schools and they were followed for many years and data um, were collected on a number of outcomes, but in particular their lung function, but also other growth parameters such as height and weight. And <clears throat> now in talking with Jim about how one might go, effect, go about analyzing the effect of air pollution on children in this study, we faced a number of features. Never mind the fact that the, the air pollution is not static and it changed over time during the years and in general across the six cities it re regressed to the mean. So that the, um, there's a, also an issue here of how you might want to analyze the fact that your primary exposure variable of interest is changing over time. But more importantly, the design of the study did not, was not to, to select an initial cohort with all at the same age and follow them, but rather the initial cohort was drawn from different grades. So as children had different ages at entry and then successive cohorts were brought on and not all cohorts were followed to the end you had staggered entry, you had staggered exit. And in addition to that, you had missing data. 
children might not show up for school the day the measurements were taken or families might move out of town and be lost to follow up. So it was a, um, a challenge to figure out what's the best way to analyze these data. So we started out by looking actually at the classical growth curve approach. And this slide I'll tell you is uh, illustrating the importance of notation. So we started out looking at, at the classical growth curve approach, which was available for statisticians at the time for analyzing growth data. And I always found the notation to be very intimidating. But I decided to show it to you anyway, because uh, you can decide for yourself if it's intimidating. So here, this matrix, of, I call this the matrix of planned observations for a classical growth curve study, which means it's a in where they're in subjects by T matrix. So they're T measurements and those subjects are all presumed to be measured on exactly the same set of T occasions. The expectation of Z in order to allow for covariates is described as a matrix A, a matrix of parameters C, and a matrix of um, what I would call the design on time. So this A, is a matrix of covariates and there are M different covariates. So in the six city study, this might be the, the city that you lived in. It might be the um, uh, sex of the child, the uh, uh, characteristics of the child that don't change over time. And P is the matrix that determines the shape of the growth curve. In other words, are you assuming linear growth over time, a quadratic, perhaps a spline describes, spline describes the growth over time. And what this uh, mean expression says is that you can only have covariates that don't change over time. And that the effect of the covariate, if a covariate affects the mean, uh, it has to affect all of the same parameters of the growth curve. And the variance of a row of C, which is the data on a single individual, is a variance covariance matrix of dimension T by T, and the rows are independent. So besides the fact that um, your data may not conform to this kind of very clean design, uh, if you have a, a large number of observations, you'll have a large number of parameters to estimate in the variance covariance matrix. So what we did in our in 1982 paper was, I think we did two things really. Number one is we changed the notation that we were going to use to describe the expected value of Y. And we also showed how one can use a random effects to simplify the structure of the variance covariance matrix. So here's the um, notation that we used. So we assumed that the outcomes for the ith subject uh, could be characterized in a T sub I by one vector. And we deliberately allowed the dimension of the, the vector to depend upon the individual, since not in every individual had the same number of observations, nor did they say it had the same number of times or ages of observations. And then you can create a giant outcome vector, um, which you get by uh, putting all of these vectors together in one big vector, where capital N is the total number of observations averaged, uh, added over all of the subjects, then the expected value of y, we showed how it can just be written very simply as x beta. So this is a typical regression equation. And most people who manage to make it through one class of statistics or biostatistics 
They have seen a regression equation. They know how to interpret the outcome and they know how to interpret the variance covariance matrix and they know how to interpret the uh, regression vector. So X here, the design matrix incorporates not only uh, the all of the information on the covariates that you have, such as the sex of the child and the um, age of the child, but the uh, times of measurements and the shape of the growth curve and beta um, contains the parameters of interest. And now there's an, a second piece of the specification of this Laird and Ware model, which says, again, each, um, each vector of observations is independent, but you can um, write for each individual, you have a TI by um, TI vector of variance covariance components. And what we showed is, and I've deleted that from this slide, is it shows that you can use a variance component approach to simplify that as structure and represent the variance covariance matrix using only a small number of variance parameters. And that leads to the general linear mixed model. So I think what the one of the central features of the Laird and Ware contribution was that we, we made it, we put the analysis of messy growth curve data into a familiar context and it made it much easier for people to implement these analyses and think about how to apply it to their own problem. Now, another topic that I wanna to talk about is meta-analysis. And I'm going to give you a few minutes to appreciate this slide. New Kuyama is, is an actual township in California. And this is a billboard which welcomes you to their town. Uh, and when this billboard was constructed, their population was 562. It's 2,150 feet above sea level, and it was established in 1951. And they have added these three quantities together to give the grand total for the town. Now, many people regard meta-analysis as similar to this, and this slide is often used to debunk the concept of meta-analysis, but I was very fortunate when I was a graduate student to have Fred Mosteller as a professor and he loved meta-analysis and he introduced me to you, the use of meta-analysis, which I feel can be extremely important. And the basic idea behind meta-analysis is you wanna answer some big questions and I'll talk about those big questions. Well, the type that Moss Teller was interested in were, for example, does psychotherapy work to help people out of their depression? Or does drug therapy work? Um, what about the class size? Does it affect the ability of pupils to learn? Is it an important variable that we should be paying attention to? These are very big social science questions. And uh, Fred was interested in applying the tools of meta-analysis to attain some answers to these questions because very often there would be available data from many, many different studies which would be relevant to answer these questions. So the particular application that I worked with Fred on was a study that he did with Gilbert uh, McPeak and they were interested in this problem of innovation in surgery. We of course hope that over time, our surgical techniques are getting better and better. And so what they did was to review journal articles from some leading journals over a number of years. And they collected data on all randomized controlled trials which were comparing a surgical innovation to a standard therapy. 
Now, it doesn't matter what surgery or what, what body part we're talking about. It's just any surgery versus standard uh, surgery or standard therapy. And they collected um, a series of studies. I think it's in the neighborhood of 20. And the observed gains that were observed were, were from minus 18, point 18. So this means that um, the cure rate for the, the surgical innervation was actually almost 20 points less than what it was for the standard. And at the other end, the surgical inner innovation had a cure rate, which was 0.25 better than the cure rate of the standard therapy. So the way I chose to model this was to use a random effect. So, but I uh, should mention that each trial also had an estimated standard error because the level of error of each study will be different. It depends upon the sample sizes in each of the groups, as well as the base rate of the um, cure rates. And so each trial then had an estimated standard error. And the question that Gilbert McPeak and Mosteller had was, how can we uh, summarize these numbers and account for the standard error in order to make an overall statement about how we're doing with regard to innovation in surgery. So I chose to use a random effects model, which was to represent this observed gain for each study as the sum of two random components. One is the mean, and that I'm going to make no assumptional, uh, no assumptions on the distributional form of this random effect. And it's the sum of that random effect which describes the effect of surgery. And then there's an error term where the error is actually calculated from the study itself. So the observed quantity is the sum of these two random variables. So you can use the EM algorithm actually to do these computations. And when you fail to make any distributional assumptions for the random effects, you end up estimating a discrete function. It essentially says, well, there are three kinds of um, outcomes here. In, in the first outcome, there's a small um, detriment for the surgical in innovation. The second kind of outcome is there's basically no difference between the surgery and the, the standard and the innovative surgery. But the third one says, actually, yes, there's a substantial gain for the surgery, but here are the probabilities underlying these latent classes. Um, and what you can see is that 95% of the time you see slightly negative or no result for the new innovation therapy. But sorry, this should be 0.05, not 0.5. So 5% of the time you will observe a winner. So a lot of people who are in the business of estimating distributions feel that this distribution is too discrete. It should have a lot more points and points of support. But uh, most of are like this fine because it's easy just to give a nice simple, lends itself well to a nice simple answer. 95% of the time, there's nothing going on, but 5% of the time you'll get a winner. So that does encourage us to continue with surgical innovations in surgery. So the last topic that I will discuss today is one that I've probably spent the last 15 to 20 years uh, devoted my time to this, and that's genetic association studies. Now, your ordinary association study is set up to demonstrate the relationship between an outcome and an 
and an exposure. And a genetic association study is really not any different from an ordinary association study, such as does smoking cause cancer. Uh, but the difference is, or some features I should say, are the exposure is the genotype of an individual. And by the genotype of an individual, I mean the actual DNA at a specific location is considered to be the exposure. And the outcome is called the phenotype. Literally, phenotype uh, was introduced to mean the manifest or observable characteristic that is the manifest result of the underlying genotype. So we tend to use the terminology genotype and phenotype when talking about an association study. And as I said, the association study and the, the genetic association study is not particularly different in many regards. You can, from the regular one, you can use a case control or a cohort study. Uh, but what does make the genetic association study unique is that you can also use families instead of control. So you can use affected individuals and their families in order to do association studies. And th this comes from the fact that we understand the biology underlying the transmission of genes from parents to their offspring. So I've been interested in these family-based association studies, but I wanna make just a comment here about um, genetic association studies with the exposure being the genotype. The uh, association studies in genetics are relatively recent phenomenon because prior to the human genome project, we really did not have the measurement techniques to obtain the genotypes on individuals. We had limited techniques which could be applied to limited individuals, but um, certainly not insufficient, certainly not sufficient measurement devices for measuring large samples of individuals. So this happened as a result of the Human Genome Project. So it was around the end of the 1990s or the beginning of this century that we actually were able to do uh, large scale association studies. And here's the fundamental idea that underlies an association study. Uh, this is called the TRIO design because we have genotype data on the father whose genotype is denoted by AB and we have genotype data on the mother, whose genotype is denoted by AA. We also have genotype data on an affected offspring. And the genotype offspring is not fixed in advance, it's random, but the distribution is known if you know the genotypes of the parents. So if I have the distribution of the, if I have the parental genotypes, I can specify the possible outcomes and the probabilities of each of the outcomes for the affected offspring. So in particular, since the mother has two copies of the A, she has to transmit the A to the affected offspring. But the father, on the other hand, has both an A and a B, so he can transmit either the A or he can transmit the B to the affected offspring. So we are going to gather data on the affected offspring, but we know in advance that the affected offspring can have either one A or two A's, and we know that the probability of that is 50-50. So the offspring genotype is not fixed, but its distribution is known, and this is known from Mendel's laws. So the analysis of this was first presented in a paper by Spielman et al. in 1993, and he called it the 
transmission disequilibrium test because the idea was to see whether or not the transmission of genotypes from parents to offspring matched what you actually observe in the offspring. So the, the test is very simple. You count the observed number of A's among the affected offspring, and then you count the number of A's um, that you predict using Mendel's laws. And then you're gonna compare the er observed to the expected using a simple chi-square test. And this gives a very simple test, and not only is it simple, but it's a very robust test of association in the sense that it doesn't depend upon any uh, making any assumptions about the population that you're drawing your subjects from. And in this case, sometimes the parents are called the controls because there's no need, no need to look at unaffected offspring to do the test. Um, however, this was a bit, this is a classic paper and a big breakthrough for um, family designs, but they did not present a general framework. And so there was a lot of speculation and confusion in the literature that appeared after the Spielman paper on, well, how do we how, how, how do we actually generalize this test to other situations and other circumstances that are of interest? So in particular, what if you're missing the parents? Uh, and this, at the time I was working on um, Alzheimer's disease, and of course, with late onset Alzheimer's disease, many people would be missing their parents, but they might have siblings one or more siblings that, whose geno genotypes were available, and that will give you information about the siblings. Um, now, why are we using only unaffected offsprings? I mean, only affected, can't you use information from unaffected offspring? Um, how would you do this if you were in interested in a quantitative trait? So suppose you have some measure of dementia and you want to know uh, do an association analysis with that. Suppose you have multiple markers, so instead of just A and B, suppose you had A, B, and C. Uh, suppose you have uh, X chromosome markers. Suppose you have gene environment interactions. Suppose you have extremely rare variants. So there are many other situations that people immediately uh, wanted to solve using this general approach. So how do we extend the TDT? We call this the family-based association test. And this was work that I did in the early 2000s with a number of colleagues, Steve Horvath, Sheen Chu, Dan Rabetowitz, and uh, uh, Christoph Lang, uh, as well as many other uh, students and colleagues. So the first thing is we had to introduce notation because the original TDT test was so simple, there wasn't even any notation that I recall that could be generalized. So here we introduce, we introduce X to denote the offspring genotype, since this is the fundamental feature of exposure. And Y is going to note the phenotype of an individual. And we're going to let P give the genotypes of a set of relatives, whatever that set of relatives could be, parents, siblings, etc. And what you can show is that the TDT is based on, the inference is based on the conditional distribution of the offspring genotype, conditioning on an individual's disease status, and conditioning on the set of family outcomes, a set, a set of family genotypes. So now this may look complicated, but actually it's quite a simple conditional distribution. And you, you can just use um, Bayes' rule to show how to compute it. So it's constructed of two parts, and then there's a normalizing constant. This first part 
This is the disease model. So this is the distribution of the phenotype given the genotype. So this is just an ordinary association model. It could be a linear regression model. It could be a logistic regression model. It could be a log linear regression model. So it's a very familiar, simple disease model. And then the distribution of the genotypes given the set of relatives well, this just specifies the known Mendelian transmission probabilities when you have parents. There's a generalization that you need to know how to do in case you don't have parents, but that's pretty straightforward to do if you have siblings. Then you can use this distribution to construct a score statistic. And the score under the, the distribution of the statistic is determined under the null, but under the null, which says there's no effect of, of the genotype on the phenotype, then this is just constant and it drops out of the likelihood. And this uh, distribution of the conditional offspring genotype, given their phenotype and the parental distribution is just the um, Mendelian transmission probability. So it's very straightforward to specify the distribution under the null. And um, notice that in this setting, even though we talked about specifying a disease model as if the phenotype is the outcome, in fact, X is the random variable here and the phenotype and the parental genotypes are taken as fixed. And the advantage of generalizing to this class of FBAT test statistics is that uh, number one is it's easy now to see how to extend it to any kind of trait, whether or not you have a measured dichotomous, a multivariate trait, when you have multiple genotypes, so multiple predictors, if you have missing parents, any kind of genetic model that you'd like to specify. It's, fair, it's all contained within this general framework. And not only that, it's easy to prove theorems to show that it can retain its robustness under uh, any type of sampling situations and the composition of populations. And then perhaps the most important thing is that there's readily available software for computing FBAT in a wide variety of situations. So I, in, in closing, I would like to acknowledge how much I have learned from my teachers, my collaborators, my colleagues, and my students, and how much pleasure I have received from these collaborations over the years. And I would also like to acknowledge Gina tillotson Fowler, who is an administrator in the Department of Biostatistics at Harvard, who has been a stalwart underpinning for my notation for the past 20 years. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nan. That was a terrific presentation. Now it's time for our first Q&A portion of the program. We have already had some great questions come in. At this time, I will stay backstage to continue to monitor the questions. Dr. Hogan will begin. So hi, Nan. Hi, Joe. Good to see you again, and, and uh, thanks so much for a really terrific lecture. Um, so we have, uh, we have some questions um, from our audience. Our audience uh, actually is coming in from, I think I counted about uh, eight or nine different countries. Um, so we have a truly international audience. And uh, I'm gonna start off with the first question, um, which has to do with your work on, uh, this is something Deepak mentioned in the introduction, um, uh, has to do with your work and the, the National Academies panel on air cabin quality. And, and the, the recommendation of that panel led to 
the current ban on smoking on airplanes. And uh, I'm actually old enough to remember taking a couple of transatlantic flights where there was a lot of smoking. So I think we're all grateful for your work on that panel. Um, and uh, yeah, I wonder if you could just uh, tell us a little bit about that experience because it seems like something where you know statistical work really led to a, a pretty broad and sweeping policy change. Thank you, Joe. Yes, I'm happy to talk about that. It, it was quite a while ago, it was like in the early 80s that this uh, work took place. And it was a time when the airlines were actually, prior to that, they had, uh, they, they took in fresh air while in flight in order to have fresh air in the cabins, but that was terribly expensive. So they were giving up those ventilation systems and they were putting in recirculating air. And because they put in recirculating air, they were, were concerned about smoking. So they put all of the non, they created smoking and non-smoking sections. And as you say, Joe, I, I would bet there are a lot of people in our audience who never knew that you could smoke in airplanes. <laughs> um, but when they had the smoking sections, they usually put them right in the galleys where the crew spent most of their time. So the crew was very concerned about the, the negative health effects of air quality in their workplace. So they, they had a very strong lobby that got Congress to appoint a committee to look into air quality. And in our committee, we did in fact look at many different aspects of air quality. But uh, the one that I was most involved in was looking at the health effects of the smoke exposure. And there were, there were I was the only statistician on the committee, but there was also a, an epidemiologist who specialized in um, cigarette exposure and uh, lung cancer and other illness. And so we were able to take measurements and get information on the levels of what's called environmental tobacco smoke or ETS mm. in the airplanes and to estimate that it was approximately that, that a crew member would have a, an average annual exposure equivalent to the spouse, the non-smoking spouse of a cigarette, a one pack a day cigarette smoker. And there was at that time already a, a small but growing literature on the effects of what I would call side stream cigarette smoking, but it's effectively being in close proximity for much of your time with cigarette smokers. And there were a number of studies, maybe 14 or 15 that we looked at. And there were two in particular that were pretty strong studies and showed significant increases for uh, people who were they were these studies pretty much all looked at non-smoking spouses mm. of one pack a day uh, spouses. So those typically showed an increased relative risk of about two. And that was, I have to say, a sort of an ideal opportunity to do uh, meta-analysis except that the studies at the time didn't necessarily all present the relevant data. So we weren't able to extract the relevant data, but we did what might be called a data synthesis, looking at these studies. They were pretty all consistent. And the thing that I remember that was funny about it was uh, we had a public hearing and the chairman of epidemiology at the Harvard School of Public Health at the time, Brian McMahon, gave testimony that a relative risk of two was way, way, way too small. No self-respecting epidemiologist would ever accept a relative risk of two. And I laugh about that every time I think of 
of the fact that in genetic studies, we're getting relative risk of 1.05 and treat them as if they're real. But uh, at any rate, the committee became convinced that the levels of cigarette particulates were higher in airplanes than they were than the standards for indoor air quality and that there was good evidence to believe that there is a real risk, which I think is now widely accepted. So mm -hmm. we did recommend a ban on smoking. And I was uh, one of the people most supportive of the ban, I think because at the time I was pretty young and naive and I didn't realize that there might be as much opposition to the ban. But it turns out, I think, People are pretty happy with the ban on the whole. Well, as a frequent flyer, I think uh, I, I stand with a lot of people that and saying that people are very happy about it in general. And it's Good. amazing how things like that, uh, you know, you were showing your mask earlier, but how, you know, behaviors like that could just some years later just feel normal. Um, yes. you know, yeah. I don't think we're all hoping that masks feel normal, but it's possible to have these public health interventions that then become normalized and beneficial. Yes, so, they do, good point. Um, so Nan, there's a couple of questions here I'm gonna lump together um, that have come in from the audience. And, you know, so you've, I mean, uh, looking back, it seems clear, you know, you were always traveling on the leading edge of statistical methodology. Um, and that's, you know, I think in my career, I'd say some people have a knack for that, but it's, I, I like to, uh, I'm glad people ask these two questions here because it uh, gives us a chance for you to share your perspective from that um, perch. And uh, the first question is, what do you think are the most promising areas in biophysics in the next five years? And I know that everyone wants to thinks of that as a $64,000 question, but I think that you're well qualified to at least weigh in on that with informed opinion um, based on your career trajectory. And there's another question about, and I think it's related, about sharing advice to junior researchers on how to choose research topics. Well, thank you for those questions, Joe. Um, th those are important questions. And I guess the one thing that I see is it's very crucial now is we have enormously large data sets that they're almost in a way data are being collected incidentally as a result of some other process. So data are collected from cell phones or data are collected from the internet. And so these cell phones and the internet weren't set up to collect data but the data are available, why not collect it and why not analyze it? So, so big data sets, I think are one, one thing that's definitely facing us now and more so in the future and how to analyze them. Computational issues, I think are very loom, very large with the big data sets um, and I think the third thing has to do with um, understanding the meaning of the data that are being collected. Other areas, well, I think the pandemic has probably awakened us to a lot of new problems. Uh, I, I think um, uh, the the future of vaccine trials. I'm sure as I understand it, there's a lot of uh, new technology in the last few years of, on how to make vaccines. And I think there probably will be new technologies on how to, how to analyze and design and analyze vaccine trials. Um, and testing is, is another issue. Um, being asked about, well, what about the false negatives, false positives? These are questions I don't know the answer to, but I think surely there's probably uh, many issues involved in testing that could be uh, improved and be very useful for future research. Um, so Dan, you know, you, uh 
you talked about your um, you talked about your uh, mixture distribution paper in the context of meta analysis. Yes, um, and it's interesting. You know, when I the first time I read that paper, I didn't really think of it as a meta analysis, but I guess that's that's exactly what it is. Um, but you know, in reading that paper now through the lens of 2020, um, it's remarkable how durable some of the ideas in that paper are. Um, that is, you know, I, I think of that paper as uh, a paper really on unsupervised learning um, in the sense that, you know, we have a distribution, we want to maybe cluster it or partition it or something like that. Um, I mean, it, it's amazing how many different sorts of citations that paper has gotten over the years from different fields. And I wonder if, you know, you, I'm guessing, of course, like back then you didn't necessarily appreciate where we would be heading, but is it just the meta-analysis problem that got you interested in that? Was it something, the bigger picture? Because well, it's, it's really quite a remarkable piece of work. Even that, that's a really good question because, um, no, I, I, I didn't really think of it as a meta-analysis, although in fact, I that that problem, that work that I did was actually motivated by uh, the work that Mosteller, uh, McPeak, and Gilbert did. So I guess you would have to say, yes, it was a meta-analysis, but I thought of it as maybe like you, I thought of it as, they, they wanted a non-parametric approach to estimating the distribution of gains. So the, the gain there is an actual measurement. It's not really observable because they want the true gain, not the one that you measured in the particular study. So you're, you have an estimated distribution of gains and you'd like to estimate the distribution, but non-parametrically non with, without assuming any particular form. And that's what I thought was the challenge there. And I, I do think that what was new about that paper was the realization that if, let me just back up a little bit, if you want to estimate a fully observed uh, distribution that is a, from a sample, the empirical CDF is just the non-parametric estimate. And of course, another example that you have is if you have sensor data, then what we know from the Kaplan-Meier is that it's the non-parametric uh, estimate is in fact discrete and it only has uh, support points at the observed death times. But I don't think that was appreciated for a mixing distribution at the time. It's now, uh, there was a lot of work done subsequently that shows, yes, it is discrete. Um, but I, I didn't realize that at the time that I did it. And I don't think it was really realized that that was the result. But so I thought of it actually just as estimating non-parametrically a distribution with incomplete data. And so it's kind of an extension of Kaplan-Meier and the M algorithm. Right. So it really, uh, as I said, it's, uh, it, it's, the paper has traveled well. It's yeah. uh, really influenced a lot of work in a lot of different areas. So, um, uh, and it's, it's, sometimes it's remarkable to go back and read, I think, you know, papers, uh, from several years ago and think like, wow, people, this is how people were thinking very, very creatively. So you were way ahead of your time then, man. Thank you, yeah. Um, okay, so this is gonna wrap up the, um, the Q&A for now. Um, I'm going to uh, be joining Christoph uh, later on after the interview, but for now, I'm gonna turn things over to, to our Master of Ceremonies, Deepak. Thank you, Joe. Uh, these are all great questions and beautiful answers. At this time, we'll be taking a 15 minute break. During our upcoming break, we will be sharing some congratulatory videos 
from our dear sponsors. We will be hearing from Ron Wasserstein from American Statistical Association, Kandan Natarajan from Pfizer, and my colleague Nidhis Mukhopadhyay from UConn. Following the videos, we will go straight to the interview portion of our program. Joe and Christoph who will be sitting down with Dr. Laird for a stimulating conversation, followed by our second opportunity to engage with Dr. Laird by submitting your own live questions at the questions tab located on the main program page. Please enjoy our sponsors' videos. Greetings, everyone, on behalf of the ASA Board of Directors. I greet you from my home in Northern Virginia, which is where I'm hanging out during these COVID days. It is our great pleasure to be one of the sponsors of this important colloquium series. There is extraordinary value in capturing the voices of people who have had an enormous impact on our profession. Since the earliest part of my career, I've benefited greatly from hearing the words of statisticians who have inspired me and so many others. If you are part of an organization who might be interested in supporting this effort, let us know. And if you have ideas for individuals we should hear from in this series, let us know that as well. The American Statistical Association is always pleased to be a part of this effort, but especially so in light of the accomplishments of this year's speaker, Nan Laird. Others will tell you specifics of her accomplishments. Let me just say this. Dr. Laird is one of those people whose name carries with it enormous respect. Naturally, she is respected for her major contributions to statistics, but she is also highly respected as a colleague, mentor, and friend by many, many people. In the grand scheme of things, I think that is even more important. So on behalf of the leadership of the ASA, I stand, extend thanks to the organizers of this event and say thanks and congratulations to Dr. Laird. We all look forward to hearing what she has to say. Hello, my name is Kanan Nitrajan, and I'm the head of Global Biometrics and Data Management at Pfizer. On behalf of Pfizer, it is my great pleasure and distinct honor to congratulate Professor Nancy Laird on her being recognized as a speaker of the 25th Pfizer ASA Yukon Distinguished Statisticians Colloquium Series. Pfizer is proud to be a sponsor of this remarkable event as it has been since the inception of this prestigious symposium in the late 1970s. The series, which included such prominent speakers as Professors C.R. Rao, Brad Efren, David Cox, and several other pioneers of the field has inspired generations of statisticians over the decades. Today, we're especially excited to see the continuation of this tradition with the recognition of Professor Nancy Laird as a tribute to her numerous contributions to our field. This recognition of Professor Laird is remarkable and timely since it's taking place at a time when the world is fighting the COVID-19 pandemic. Using all the tools available in our scientific armamentarium and more than ever, statistics is key in designing and evaluating the outcomes of therapeutic options and to potentially eliminate the pandemic. It is thus most fitting to bestow the recognition upon Professor Laird, whose landmark results have been the cornerstone of pharmaceutical statistics and clinical research for the last several decades. Her 1977 seminal work with Dempster and Rubin that presented the ubiquitous EM algorithm for computing maximum likelihood estimates from incomplete data has been the mainstay of pharmaceutical statistics in every stage of drug development. In meta-analysis, her joint work with Rebecca de Simonian is routinely used in comparative effectiveness research to inform decision-making by healthcare professionals about the relative risks and benefits of alternative treatment options. Professor Laird is of course also widely known for her other work in numerous areas of application, including statistical genetics and statistical methods 
for psychiatric epidemiology, and it is by no means my intent to attempt to enumerate all her scholarly accomplishments in a very brief introductory remark like this one. However, I would be remiss if I failed to mention her equally significant impacts on many statisticians who have benefited not only by the highest standard of excellence, she has epitomized throughout her career, but also the indelible mark she has made on their lives through her numerous engagement as a coach, mentor, advisor, and teacher. To reiterate, Pfizer takes extreme pride to be part of this noble effort to recognize achievements of statisticians like Professor Laird. In fact, Statistics at Pfizer has a long and laudable history. It was at Leverly Labs in Pearl River, in New York, one of the research sites of today's Pfizer, where in 1945, Frank Wilcoxon developed his famous non-parametric procedures, the Wilcoxon Ransom and Sign Rank Test, while well, well, working on this chemistry data. It was also at the same site where Charles Dunnett published in 1955 his celebrated work related to the critical values of the most extreme difference between treatment and control means. Over the decades, numerous other Pfizer statisticians that followed Bill Coxon and Dunnett have contributed to advance the field of statistics and pharmaceutical medicine. Today, there are over 200 statisticians and data scientists at Pfizer distributed across the globe, from Shanghai in China, Chennai in India, to sandwich in England, as well as the different parts of the United States. Our statisticians are not only engaged in the race to bring the much needed medicines to patients, but are also involved in developing new methodology and perfecting the existing one in areas as diverse as genomics, innovative trial designs, health technology assessment, and modern analytics. By any measure, our field is at crossroads undergoing unprecedented transformation fueled by digital revolution. Pharmaceutical statistics is especially presented with unique challenges and opportunities. Smart algorithms are brought to bear to advance the discovery of new drugs or repurposing the existing ones. Artificial intelligence and machine learning techniques are accelerating the pace of research in precision medicine. Virtual trials are increasingly becoming the new normal thanks to the availability of new digital technologies. Unsurprisingly, statisticians are poised to play a central role in this new and exciting world. This is of course made possible thanks to a major part to the very strong foundation laid down by pioneers like Professor Nancy Laird. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank both the ASA and UConn for their engagement with Pfizer in this and many other worthwhile endeavors. Special thanks to go to Ron Wasserstein and Professor Deepak Day for their leadership and vision that helped create a conducive environment for collaboration. University of Connecticut, apart from being a friendly neighbor near our Groton, Connecticut site, it hosts the very best statistics department with world-renowned faculty members. Our other collaborations with UConn includes the commendable partnership concerning the Pfizer Global Research and Development Student Fellowship Program launched to inspire young statisticians and about the role of statistics and statisticians in drug development and medical research. Finally, with the support of Ron Wasserstein and the American Statistical Association, we are very fortunate to archive this colloquium and discussion with Professor Laird for all statisticians of today and for the future. Last but not least, I'd like to thank members of the steering committee for their hard work in making this wonderful occasion a reality, albeit virtually. As parting words, I would like to conclude with a quote from Professor Laird's conversation with uh, Louis Ryan, published in, in a 2015 issue of Statistical Science, where she said, I think, it is really important to like what you do and enjoy your work. The really hard question is how to find something that you love doing, that you have to answer to yourself, but it is what you need to do if you are to succeed. Obviously, it is good for science that Professor Laird discovered early in her career that statistics was what she loved to do. Otherwise, the field of statistics would have been quite different. Thank you.
and congratulations to Professor Lev. Hello, greetings. I'm Nitis Mukhopadhyay, professor in the Department of Statistics, University of Connecticut Stores. Professor Deepak Day requested me to prepare brief remarks for this 25th Distinguished Statistician Colloquium 2020. I am honored to take part, virtually of course, and I take this opportunity to thank Deepak. This project originated 40 plus years ago at the University of Connecticut Stores under the leadership of the late Professor Harry Poston and Dr. David Salzberg from Pfizer and Dr. Fred Leone, then the ASA director. In view of the historical importance of this project, this initiative had been supported by Pfizer Global Research, the Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut and the American Statistical Association since late 1970s. The first films captured Georgie Neyman, Harold Kramer, Sia Rao, George Box. After I joined Yukon Stores in 1985, I became deeply involved in the filming of Maurice Hansen, <coughs> excuse me, that was in 1985, Fred Mosteller, 1987. It was my personal thrill to introduce Herman Chernoff, 1989, on the film followed by the filming of Harb Robbins, 1990, Janet Norwood, 2000. After Professor Poston's death in March 2002 and Dr. Salzberg's retirement from Pfizer, myself and Dr. Knight E. Ting, then with Pfizer, served as program leaders. Dr. Bill Duggan joined us in August 2009. I began directing the project then and produced films on Brad Efron, David Brillinger, Chris Heidi, Manny Parson, Barbara Baylor, Steve Feinberg, and P.K. Sen. The Sen film dated 2012. By 2014, the funding dried up due to very poor economy at the time. I'm delighted that Deepak Day's leadership and energy and other younger colleagues' initiatives have recently revived the project. Nan Laird is our 2020 honoree in this distinguished colloquium series for ASS archive. Now she joins a long list of luminaries. Congratulations, Nan. We are preserving our profession's wonderful history. We are also proudly creating it. So you all enjoy the rest of the festivities.
Nan, thank you for a really terrific talk. Uh, for those who have tuned in, this is the um, interview portion of the Pfizer colloquium. And traditionally, the colloquium uh, interview component gives a real chance to uh, explore a little bit about uh, the speaker's career and maybe ask some questions about the, the talk and, and really just have a conversation um, between uh, Nan and uh, two, of, two of her fortunate colleagues that are here today to be able to uh, follow up and, and talk through some of her research and her experience as a distinguished statistician. So thanks again, Nan, for the opportunity. And thanks, Christoph, for being here as well. Uh, for those who don't know, I feel very fortunate to have been Nan's student uh, between 1991 and 1995 at Harvard. And Nan, it probably um, you know, isn't a story I've told you before, but I was given a paper by my master's advisor at USC about the EM algorithm. This was in uh, probably 1989. And when I read the paper, I was fascinated with the idea that you could use statistics to estimate things that weren't there. And uh, this sort of launched my fascination with missing data. And uh, I don't have a copy of it, but I do remember specifically writing in my personal statement for my application that I wanted to work with Nan Laird on the, on the EM algorithm and missing data. Um, now they put me on the wait list, so I guess that wasn't really the right hook, but uh, eventually it all worked out. And, and you know, <clears throat> my experience as a student with you really has influenced uh, all, all kinds of aspects of my career, uh, from research to teaching and to advising. And so I, I feel really honored to have this opportunity to, to spend time with you. And I, I would imagine that I speak for Christoph um, and saying that as well. And I'm... Yeah. <clears throat> It, it, George was certainly um, uh, very much the same experience for me as well. When I finished my PhD, um, uh, it was back in um, England. I wasn't really sure what to do. And at that time, I knew Dave Harrington, and I reached out. And I, I thought I wouldn't expect um, to get an answer regarding the possibility of doing a postdoc in Boston. And then I heard back from Nan, and I thought initially um, that was a mistake or an error. And it turned out um, when I prepared for this um, interview um, back in January, I looked back and asked myself, since when have we been collaborating? I realized it has been 20 years. And um, I, I think that says pretty much everything about the colleague, the mentoring um, man has been um, for me over the last 20 years. And yeah, it's, it's probably not a coincidence. Yesterday we were just writing a paper and I wasn't really sure how to um, present the data analysis results. The person I called was Nan. So Nan, <clears throat> so we have an opportunity to ask you a few questions <clears throat> about your talk and hopefully touch on things about your career. Um, so, you know, one uh, sort of jumping off from your talk, uh, one thing that really struck me at the beginning is you said that your philosophy in approaching uh, scientific problems was to start with some, say, smaller scale, discrete, well-defined problem, and then work your way out toward more general solutions. And, you know, it struck me as I just thought about the different projects that even we worked on together um, and then just reading through some papers over the years of yours, I, I could really see that, that theme emerging. And one thing that um, I've always tried to be conscious of in my career is you know, how, to, how to pick a problem to work on. Um, sometimes these are open-ended, we can come up with our own ideas and sometimes problems sort of approach us. Uh, do you, did you throughout your career have sort of a, <clears throat> a guiding set of principles or a, a way you selected certain certain problems to work on you know what what things you found appealing or not appealing how, how did you sort through that thank you joe thanks to both to you and to christoph for those kind words i uh, it's a, a real pleasure for me to be here today too to talk with you and to address your uh your question you know i, I think first of all there's the issue of opportunity how do you get the opportunity to collaborate and engage with people? And 
I think that um, I think I, I think that in graduate school it's a little bit difficult. You're so focused on learning the essentials and the basics. It's hard to have the opportunity to initiate collaborations or or consult or or to teach. I have always found I've learned a lot from my students, and it's been a big pleasure to have students which brought problems, who brought problems to me that they were interested in solving, or perhaps they took a course because they thought it was relevant to what they're interested in. So I find, I find through applications is a great way to find your problems. Also through consulting is a great way to find problems. Um, I, I just, in my experience, applications have been a good way to do it. And I think you have to, not only do you have to talk with your collaborators, your students, your consultees, but you also have to dig into the literature a little bit. I think something that, um, something we can forget often is that a lot of your learning happens after you graduate. <laughs> A lot. But what you learn as, an, uh, as a student is important to enable you to dig into the, lit the relevant literature when people bring you a problem. But getting an another feature I think is very important is uh, knowing how to make a, a problem solvable. And this is something that I saw often from Fred Mosteller was he had a real knack for taking a big problem and making it simple, gathering some simple uh, information and that would enable him to answer hard questions. Like I thought, the exam as I mentioned in the talk, the example about um, are there innovations in surgery? They, he managed to tackle that, I think, in a very ingenious way to give a very broad and certainly a non-specific but useful answer to that general question. And I think finally, I have to say, I think my personal experience that collaborations are so much more fun than working on problems by yourself. And there is a chemistry, though, and you have to sort that out for yourself as to what you are attracted to. Yeah, that, that, that really resonates. The, um, <clears throat> you know, you're, you're conveying that, you know, taking a difficult problem and making it simple reminds me of when, when, when you and I were working together, I think I sometimes took simple problems and tried to make them <laughs> difficult. And uh, so you had a good yeah. influence on me there. Um, I remember one specific time where we were working on uh, one of the two uh, papers from that, that got published early from my thesis, and you finally, I, I kept bringing new ideas about the paper, and you said, Joe, for heaven's sake, send the paper. <laughs> yes. That, that well, was. Fred Mosteller had another saying. He, he was very famous for saying, we are no longer allowing new ideas. We're going to finish. No one's allowed another new idea until this paper is finished. Right. It's an ironic thing for a scientist to say, but it's really necessary to, to yes. move things out. Um, I guess kind of on a related <clears throat> note, I, I, you know, in, in thinking about your career and, and other senior statisticians I've, I've known, I think one thing that really characterizes your career is that you have made like statistically deep contributions to not just a number of subject matter areas, but in a number of statistical areas. I think that's really remarkable. Um, you have worked on, you know, non-parametric inference problems. You've worked on parametric models. You've used Bayesian methods. You've used frequentist methods. Um, the things you did in missing data, I think there's some mild overlap with what you did with population genetics, but not a tremendous amount. And so I, what, it's just, it's fascinating to me because I think that what maybe the, the grounding underneath all of this is 
sort of a, a deep understanding of statistical principles, statistical thinking. And one thing that is curious, I'm curious about is, are there principles that you sort of found yourself returning to over and over as you grappled with problems, not only in different <clears throat> uh, subject matter domains, but in different statistical inference domains, statistical methods domains? You know, is there sort yes. of a, you know, your, your canon of statistical principles, so to speak, that you keep returning to? Because I can only imagine that you'd have to have something like that to work on such a wide variety of problems, but yet make such substantial contributions. Well, it's true. I've, I've worked on a variety of things, but at, at the basis of almost everything I've done is the likelihood principle. I would say <clears throat> the, the likelihood principle is sort of at the bottom of, of everything I've done. And I suspect I owe that to Art Dempster. Uh, that was <laughs> emphasized in my training. And I think um, sort of with regard to techniques, I've, I've, um, I've also used random effects a lot um, for or variance component models. They've just seemed to be very natural and very useful in, in applied context. But as you mentioned, in some cases, I've dealt with models. I've done work in non-parametric statistics. But even with the non-parametric statistics, it's been maximum likelihood that's been the focus of my work. And when you, when you think about, for example, growth curves, it, in, it combines maximum likelihood with random effects, and variance components. Um, and empirical base, that's another area which is, again, I think pretty closely relinked with random effects and likelihoods. But in genetics, it does, it is seemingly different, but even there, the main work that I did on family-based association tests, that's, those are score tests that come from deriving a likelihood. And I think the reason why, uh, why that work is more relevant in genetics was that the work that I and to some extent Christoph have been primarily engaged in is testing whether or not genetic variants are associated with disease. And quite often, you're not interested in this, this specific genetic variant because you think that it's actually disease causing but rather because you think it's in an area or region where the disease gene might be. So estimation is not nearly as important as testing in this context. And I think that explains why the methods are seemingly a bit different. But the score test in genetics is, a, as I said, is, is, is quite interesting because it, it enables you to derive the distribution of your statistic under a null hypothesis that you feel quite comfortable, you can say it's very robust mm -hmm. to assumptions about the data. So it's regarding, oh, sorry, Joe. Yeah. Uh, regarding, uh, regarding uh, your change to genetics, I mean, what you mentioned earlier and when you answered um, the question um, that Joe asked you, um, how you pick topics um, there are these topics that we get from students and they are really exciting because um, it's just the most productive way to work um, to find new problems and provide answers to important questions but with your change to genetics um, there's a relative or for me at least there was a relatively there was there was a lot of leg work to do uh, before I could see the first problem um, I had dropped uh, biology in ninth grade um, and um, with when you started in genetics, I assume you, uh, you had to do quite a bit. Um, you had to go back and at least spend a couple of months uh, just making sure you understand uh, biology. How do you do this uh, if you want to branch out to such a new area of topics? Uh, what makes you decide it's worthwhile the investment? Uh, was genetics your only way uh, we, tried, we branched out or have you tried other areas as well? So that's a that's a good question, Christoph. I um, I would say genetics is the area that I 
uh, devoted most time, as you said, to coming up to speed. In fact, I spent a year sabbatical in a, the lab of a statistical geneticist, Jonathan Haynes, in order to find out what what was going on, what what were the current is interesting problems in this field, and so I spent a lot of time reading papers in statistical genetics, and a lot of what was had very statistical content, so it wasn't really hard. But I find, especially with something like genetics, there can be a huge language barrier. They just use terms that you're not so familiar with, and I think. I have found that in almost every field, you, you kind of need a dictionary to get started to read the literature in another domain. But I also think that um, any, any work you do that's going to be of good value and that's um, substantive, you have to have a collaboration with the subject matter people. Even if it's theoretical work, you need to know whether or not it's really practical or relevant in their field to be doing what you're proposing to do. So I, th I think that's a really good point. And how do you decide? I think it has to do with what you're interested in. I just found genetics to be a really intrinsically interesting subject, so I was willing to put in the time to do that. Um. <clears throat> So Nan, I'm gonna uh, switch gears a little bit, um, and I'm. Uh, I think you're well prepared for this question, even though I didn't give it to you in advance. But I, <laughs> I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't ask about this. You know, um, you uh, when you came up in the world of statistics, there really weren't a lot of women. Um, you didn't have uh, female teachers. You didn't have a lot of female classmates. Um, you know, can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts about how things have changed and, you know, what our profession can be doing to promote more engagement um, by women, by, uh, by female faculty? Um, what's sort of your, you know, looking, looking at it through the, the arc of your own career and now surveying where we are now? What, what's your sense of, uh, of where we're at and what we still have to do? So... Thank you, Joe. You're right. I should be prepared for that question. <laughs> but what you said about when I was in graduate school and undergraduate school, and I was taking courses in statistics and, and uh, both at the undergraduate and the graduate level and math, there were very few faculty and none at all in the Department of Statistics at Harvard when I got my degree. There were very few faculty who were women. But what you said about um, fellow students is not true. Interestingly enough, if you look at the statistics on percentages of women in graduate schools in, in statistics and biostatistics, it's relatively high. And, and in our own department of, uh, at the School of Public Health and Biostatistics, it's been consistently around 50% for a long time. And of course, we do much better in the faculty now in terms of uh, percentage of women. But there's a mystery, which is still, I think, unresolved as what, what happens to the women in statistics and biostatistics because they become a bit invisible after they graduate. It may be that they go into uh, government. It may be that, that they go into uh, uh, industry um, or education. It's, it's, it's a bit of a mystery, and I, but it is changing. Definitely is changing. Um, and I, I, I think I'm optimistic that it will continue to change. And not only in biostatistics, but geez, in politics too. Wouldn't we like to see more women? Yes, yeah. I think you're, uh, you're sharing the sentiment of a, of a lot of us. <laughs> So we still have we still have plenty of work to do. Yes, 
we do. Um, so uh, let me just ask about um, uh, thinking again about the underlying statistical principles that you use in, in some of your work, uh, you know, thinking about uh, graduate education. You know, we hear a lot in the age of data science that, uh, you know, we might as well leave the theory behind at this point. Uh, of course, I'm, I'm presenting a cartoon version of the sentiment. I don't think that that's really exactly how uh, statistics and, and biostatistics departments are thinking. But I, but I do hear about serious discussions about the balance between theory and practice, especially um, because data science has sort of, you know, taken on many, many different dimensions. Uh, and hearing you say that, you know, well, the likelihood principle sort of guided me through this very heterogeneous set of problems that I worked on. Um, you know, do you have, do you have something to say to say grad students or even departmental leaders who are, who are grappling with this? Uh, you know, we're even hearing from our own students. We don't want to learn Basu's theorem. We want to learn how to code things in Python. Uh, where, you know, can you just give us some sort of words of wisdom over a long stretch, a long successful stretch, uh, where you really made a lot of, as I said, a lot of contributions in various areas. Um, where, where do we try to strike the balance? And I'm not asking you to pick topics like this topic keep and this topic not keep, but maybe just sort of a... Well, I have to, I have to... I have feelings about that as well. Oh, well, there was sure lots of them. I, um, I, I'd be happy to hear that. No, I think this is the, the $64,000 question, really. Um, I, I believe that the fundamental principles of probability and inference, they are extremely important. And I think that definitely should keep. Now, exactly what we include in that is a different issue. I also think that fundamental concepts such as association studies, almost everybody wants to do association studies and there's some general principles of association studies that people need to know about. Same is, is true for prediction. Um, but beyond that, I, I do share a lot of uh, your concern about the fact that Many people question what we're teaching and how relevant is it for the future. The topic, the new topic that I feel I didn't learn enough about is computational issues. And I, I can't say that I'm, I missed out on learning how to program in, in Python. I, I don't feel that I missed out much on that. Although it does seem to me that we cannot ignore the fact that the requirements that students need are shifting, especially in that direction of knowing about data management and data computation issues. But the, the thing that I see being neglected a lot is uh, topics such as sampling, survey, data, uh, sample survey design, Sample survey design is rel relatively uh, obsolete in, in our curricula today, but it needs to be updated so it fits with the modern world because I think the new technologies of data collection have made it so easy to get certain kinds of data, but when you try and patch it together with uh, more traditional data, the clinical data, the social science data, that it's not clear how to interpret the composition of the sample or the population or how it's meaningfully interpreted. So I think there's some still very basic principles of study design and data collection. That's become more important than ever, is what I think. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense because we're, I think it's just the widespread availability of data has really turned loose a lot of efforts to make sense of it. Yes. Yeah, I think that's right. And so I, I've used up, uh, I've, I've been asking a lot of the questions, but I want to uh, uh, give Christoph a chance to ask some questions as well. And um, 
So yeah, Christoph, why don't why don't I hand the baton over? Okay, um, thank you so much. Joe. No, um, then when you asked me um, about this colloquium, colloquium and we talked initially about it in January, um, I kind of had my list already of questions that I would ask you, and I guess I also had um, kind of my expected answers. And then um, 2021 came, COVID came, racial disparities, Black Lives Matter. And I think the, the world that we are facing as scientists, as biostatisticians, uh, within a few months has absolutely fundamentally changed in terms of how we see our role, where we can contribute to. So um, what are, where do you think are the major roles or the major questions biostatistics could help answer in the current situation and if you are picking your next research topic for the next 20 years what would you pick personally thank you Christoph, for that opportunity <laughs> well so uh, not only has it changed the has it changed fundamentally for biostatisticians it's changed for everybody it's changed for us personally so it's it it is it's been a tremendous force in everybody's thoughts, I think, over the past, past few months. And I have to say, in my view, vaccines are key to solving this problem. And I agree that uh, better treatments are important, but vaccines are essential if we're to get through this. And vaccine development right now is in a very, very visible position. And statisticians are, they are the people on the ground running these trials. The statisticians have tremendous responsibility for vaccine trials. And vaccine trials are under the microscope right now. So I think you know, right now, the role of statisticians who are involved or who are not involved are, first of all, to support those of our colleagues who are involved to the extent that we can and to educate the public about the importance of this work. I feel it is within our power to develop safe and effective, effective vaccines, but it's unclear that the American public feels that way. And, and why do I feel that? I think part, a large part of my feeling has to do with the years that I've worked with colleagues who are either in the FDA, who are in the drug industry, who are in academia, um, and who have really developed methods for developing safe and effective therapies, including vaccines. But they're under the gun right now. There's so much question about it. I think there'll be tremendous pressure on statisticians involved to push the envelope here and there. And of course, we should take advantage of all the new technologies that are available and the collaborations that are ongoing. But statisticians in the industry need to be tough in in running these trials. They need to be really tough and hold the line and insist that we come out with a product that's valuable. And I, I have nothing but great respect for statisticians in the industry right now. So that's, that's my two cents worth about the vaccine research that's going on. If I were still active right now, I would, I would love to be involved in the vaccine trials. I'm sure there are many questions that are ongoing that people are interested in. And I, I think another thing, a feature that I see is that when I was coming along in academia, people were careful not to be too involved in applications because they thought you wouldn't get the methodological publications that were necessary for securing your funding and securing your future. And I think though, there's so many important applied problems 
that statisticians can contribute to, that I hope that this kind of bias against applied statistics uh, will abate. Thank you very much, Nan. And um, just, um, I guess our time is almost up. Yeah, just returning quickly um, to one of Joe's earlier questions regarding uh, the role of women in statistics, and now putting it in the context um, of fostering um, more diversity in the field in general. And how do you, how do you see the progress that we have made? In particular, um, how do you, um, the importance of teaching, mentoring um, students and postdoctoral fellows and junior faculty? Yes, yeah, so I guess I'm taking part of your question as being um, our sense since the top level still continues to be somewhat dominated by males in many institutions, are they taking their female graduate students yeah. as seriously? Um, you know, I, I think for sure in my education, I did feel a lack of, um, in some cases, a lack of opportunities because I was female and I was not taken as seriously. And I, I think there is, of course, the issue of the work-life balance. It continues to be the woman's responsibility, primarily, to raise the children and take care of the family. There's that, without a doubt. And how does that happen? I think, but that, Christoph, you raised the issue of diversity itself, and I I agree with that. I think it's not just women, but it's minorities who don't always have the same opportunities. And I do think that stressing the, the lack of opportunities is probably more important than the availability of opportunities and to sort through what kind of more subtle opportunities are available. Do, who do you give your best problems to? And, and looking back on my own career, I have to admit, mostly I collaborated with men. And I'm, I'm questioning myself now. Why, why is that? Well, you might see two of them that feel lucky that, uh, <laughs> that we got a chance to collaborate with you. Thank uh, you. You know, it's interesting about um, this is a discussion of women in, in statistics, data science, and, and now and so to say the intersection with COVID. Um, one thing I've noticed, and this is just completely ad hoc, is that a lot of the leading voices in COVID data analysis are women. Uh, so, you know, early on, um, my uh, uh, when I was tuning to CNN, one of the faces that popped up repeatedly was uh, Natalie Dean, who's a yes. in vaccine research. Yes. Uh, Ramar Mukherjee at Michigan has led efforts in India. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, our colleague, Chi Hong Lin, uh, mm -hmm. has been a leading authority on, on uh, sorting out the data coming from China and other places. Mm -hmm. um, and there's also, there's a, you know, a, a longer list, uh, but it's perhaps, you know, again, it's not, uh, we're not doing causal inferences here, but uh, I think that it's, it's, somewhat um, gratifying to see that uh, you know when when our stat when our profession of statistics is represented uh, in a public way that, that there are plenty of women that are that are the face of the profession and maybe this is a little bit of a reangling toward the future yeah well that's I think that's uh, an interesting point are women more drawn to applications and my own, uh, my own feeling as a statistician was I, I'm a very practical person. I like for my stuff to be used and I like to, I like to have it a practical uh, application. And that may be characteristic of women. It was characteristic of my mother. So maybe it can be generalized in that way. Right. That's a basic. And in terms of opportunity, one might think also that um, this, at least with COVID-related data, has at least changed. If I look at um, 
how difficult it often was for us to get genetics data. Now with all the um, international COVID um, projects, you can just go to the web page and literally download um, 10,000, 12,000 COVID genomes uh, with little approval process. So maybe um, I, going I think that's through the urge. Excellent point, excellent point. And it's kind of ties in with what I was saying earlier. You have access to vast databases, which the emphasis on the database is the more technological piece of the data and the clinical data. You're not so sure what it, what, how to interpret it and what does it mean? That's, that's becoming, I think, that's a problem. And that's the point when I call you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Christoph, uh, do you have uh, other questions? Uh, no, this was pretty much my list at this point. Okay. So I just want to, one, one last thing I thought of in thinking about these questions is, I want to emphasize what I said earlier that I think as a graduate student, the thing you don't understand is you're going to learn a lot after you get out of graduate school. And not only that, you're going to learn your entire career. If you don't, it's boring otherwise. So you, you don't need to, you shouldn't, as a graduate student, feel, oh, it's my only chance to learn something. It's going to continue throughout your life. And I remember once when I was just a year or two out of graduate school, I was asked by this company to consult uh, on, on log linear models. And I, I did know something about log linear models, but I didn't think I was an expert and I didn't know anything about this, what this company did. So I turned them down. And then I later realized that that was the way I was going to learn was to do the consulting. So I encourage students to take an optimistic look about their future and uh, recognize that there's going to be a lot of opportunities out there for you. You just have to learn how to take them. Well, Ned, that was, uh, that's, a, that's a great sentiment to, to close on. Um, I think it's something you certainly have taught me and uh, I'm guessing you've taught Christoph the same, and uh, and we really appreciate the time you've taken. And um, I'll give Christoph a, a, a second to say something, but I just also want to just express my extreme appreciation for uh, for your example and for your being a role model. As I said in my in my career, in the various aspects of my career, um, I feel privileged to have been uh, your student and to have been associated. Uh, with you and your work over the years. So thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. So, yeah, thank you so much, Ned, for this conversation, but uh, even more uh, for the last 20 years of collaborating. Uh, you have been my one mentor during that time, and you still are. And I very much appreciate um, yeah, yeah, um, these 20 years. I, I can't describe it. And I very much look forward um, to continue to do that in the future as well. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Christoph and Joe, both. It's been a real pleasure to have you here with me today. Thank you. Right. Thanks Thank again. You. And I think we're moving now to the next phase of the program. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Thank you so much, Nan, for your insights. I think uh, Joe and me are uh, back again. So this is another opportunity for the audience to submit questions um, um, for Nan. Joe and I will monitor the questions and um, ask Nan. Um, so just to get a head start, um, I wanted to ask Nan as a follow-up question to the interview. When we look at the graduate students in um, statistics and biostats department, we see about equal proportions of female and male students. But when we look at the faculty level, that is often not the case. So what do you think um, we could um, do better as a discipline um, to improve this. Thank you, Christoph. Um, so first of all, let me say, I don't think it's necessarily our discipline. Uh, what I'm most familiar with is really being an academic. Uh, and I think the, the difficulties that women face in statistics are probably not fundamentally different from the difficulties that all women in academia face. And I, 
I think one obvious issue is the biological clock uh, for women uh, is, is competing with the tenure clock. And of course, tenure is conceived uh, as a way to protect faculty, to protect them. They've given their best years to an institution and the tenure rewards them with the ability to stay there without feeling threatened for their political views. And certainly tenure is a great thing and I'm not suggesting that we get rid of it, but I do think it competes with the desire of young faculty, not only women, but men as well, to start their families at a relatively early age. Because uh, let's face it, having children is not something to take lightly. It's, it's an enormous commitment of time and intellectual capital that you feel you need to be reserving for your career if you're working towards tenure. So I think there's a lot of tension as to, to delay childbearing until after you get tenure. And I, that's not necessarily a good strategy, I think. Uh, you still need your intellectual capital no matter when. Um, and, and most women do not choose these days to ha have a family before they go to graduate school or during graduate school. I think many of them feel like that would be the end of their possibility. So I guess what I think is it's a hard issue and I don't know the answer to it, but I think that we need a lot more flexibility in our system. I mean, think about it. Uh, people's life, intellectual lifespan is increasing and a lot of people stay on in their uh, jobs as professors into the, well into their 70s, even 80s and, and in many cases. So the lifespan of faculty members very long and so we, we shouldn't think that we have to spend 50 years at it. And I think that taking a more flexible point of view is an important thing to do. And I know many institutions like our own have chosen to do things like, well, we'll, give, we'll add a year to your tenure clock for every child that you have. Uh, to me, that's never seemed like an appropriate balance. Uh, it's not, it's not possible to just take a year off from your profession and do nothing but raise your child. And so it's, it does, it seems like your heart is in, in the right place, but it's not really effective. So I, I think that's a big issue that we need to grapple with. And I don't know to what extent the same is true in uh, industry and academia. But I, I expect the problem is a bit less, but maybe not as pronounced, but still present. Thank you so much, Ned. Uh, I just wanted to follow up quickly on Joe's question regarding um, COVID and the um, smoking ban on um, airplanes. So I can imagine at the beginning um, that must have been controversial um, as well, um, with at least some of the passengers similar to um, the idea of what you where you put when you put up your mask, uh, wearing yes. masks in public these days. And um, given that from our point of view as statisticians, the data is couldn't be clearer um, on the benefits. Uh, based on your experience with the smoking ban, uh, what um, as a field, um, I mean, we can blame it, of course, partly, and it's probably fair to do that on politics, but uh, we as statisticians, it's our, at least um, based on your experience, should we, what, how can we improve, to put it in your words, our notation um, to transfer what we've learned um, from the data regarding, for example, math better to the public? That's a great question, Christoph, and I, I haven't thought of it. I, I certainly have thought of what's our responsibility as statisticians in context of vaccines and in, and 
convincing the public that we can and will produce safe and effective vaccines and that people should take them. Um, but with regard to the mask, you're absolutely right. There's a lot of data out there that says it's the right thing to do and we should certainly do it. And uh, to whatever extent we can encourage people in that direction, we should. And with regard to the smoking ban, I think it's interesting. A lot of people on the committee were very worried about the smoking ban because they thought the airlines wouldn't like it because then people wouldn't be flying, which is of course not true. People are gonna fly. <laughs> um, and they thought that um, they were worried about the mental health of the smokers who weren't gonna be able to smoke on long distance flights. Um, but you know, Today, I, I hear nothing but positive things about the, the ban. People got used to it. And, and frank, quite frankly, the airlines loved it because it saved them so much money. They didn't have to clean up the air. So. OK, thank you so much. Uh, Joel, yeah. do you have another question? Yeah, Nan, um, you know, looking over the span of a career, uh, I, I mean, I remember thinking this when I was a student, even in the in the short period of time that we were collaborating, you know, I would wonder, how, how does she do this? How, how do you do it? I mean, it, it's sort of related to maybe the question that you were talking about, you know, balancing family life, balancing academic life. Uh, so one of the questions in the in the chat box is, you know, do you have do you have advice for junior faculty um, in terms of like time management and career development. It really is, the, the way I think of the word to question informally is, how did you do it? Um, <laughs> and well, then maybe you could say some things about how you're managing your time these days. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, so one thing is it's really important to have a supportive spouse who, and, and who feels that your career is also important to them and that your children are, and their children are important. So I think that's, that is very important. Um, and, and another thing, well, it's, it's interesting that you ask about time management. I remember when I was young and just starting out in time, and I read an article on time management and said, oh, well, you have to start way in advance to, to prepare for this or prepare for that. And then much later in my career, I learned, I read something that says, ah, don't start until the last minute because otherwise you'll spend all your time preparing. I do find that that's true and that I did take that to heart and I spend, tend to spend less time preparing uh, than I used to. And, uh, but I still spend a lot of time preparing and uh well and the last thing is i i guess to find out how successful i've been at, at managing a family as well as a career you really have to ask my kids thank so these days how are you how are you managing your time oh, are, these you, days, are no. you active in research are you active in uh, research involving your grandchildren uh, uh yeah <laughs> yeah both <laughs> Both. I still work some with Christoph and with uh, colleagues at the Channing and uh, I, it, doing events such as these and um, doing a lot of research on grandchildren. Yes. And do you have time to tell us maybe about one or two of the, the projects you're keeping busy with? I mean, uh, it's, it's terrific to know you're, you're still working. I guess your collaborations are primarily then and still in, in uh, uh, familial studies and genetics. <laughs> Mm, with Christoph, I, I, I'm doing some work with Christoph, which Christoph is always doing different things, still in genetics, but it's a, it's fun every day right now trying to sort through a, uh, a, a data set on the genome of the uh, COVID-19 virus and piece together how that fits with um, the clinical data. Um, I'm also the group at Channing I work with is a it's it's a it's a book club and so I'm I'm learning 
at least when I have the time to participate, I'm learning about data science. So uh, that's fun. Not that I expect I'll use it, but it's always good to stay, keep your mind active. Thanks, Nick. Um, one question um, from the chat box was, I guess, regarding to um, that we're now with sequencing done with the entire genome. How, how do you see um, the future of the field of statistical genetics? Or what do you see as a future oh. challenging challenges there? Ooh, that's uh, actually, that's why I retired. <laughs> <laughs> Then I should do probably the same. <laughs> well, then maybe I could I could ask this question. You saw some future in statistical genetics uh, back in the, the mid '90s, um, and you know you you touched on this a little bit during the interview. But one thing I've always found fascinating is that you were able to and essentially set aside, you know, an entire body of work. Maybe not set it aside, but really shift directions in a fairly dramatic fashion. Um, you know, what, what, that took a lot of guts, for lack of a better way to put it, I feel, uh, just sort of, you know, thinking at those sorts of points in my own career. And what, what was the impetus and what did you see there that, um, that, well, that caused that leap? I think a lot of us mid-career folks would really benefit from hearing your perspective on that. That's a, that's a very fair question. Um, because prior to getting into genetics, I had I had worked a lot in missing data and complete data, the EM algorithm, longitudinal data, and I, and then also for the past nine years, I had been chair of the department. So I was really ready to do something different. And one of the things that I did as chair was I, I took that as an opportunity to to try and get our department more engaged in genetic research, because at the time we were really doing longitudinal data, epidemiological studies, clinical trials, and, um, and we really were not doing anything in genetic research. Um, and I became aware that other departments were and I sort of, I mean, partly it was as a department chair, I thought this is a field that our department should be getting into. And so I, I had a seminar series on that. And then I had a sabbatical coming up. So I had an opportunity to go and, and, and spend a year in a lab to sort out whether or not there was something to be done there. And I think I came into the field of statistical genetics as a really key time because it was when the whole era of linking, linkage analysis was kind of being phased out because we were getting so much more genetic data and we got into genetic association studies. And there I felt I had much more to contribute to what was happening. Okay, Nan. Um, I just got the notice um, from the moderator uh, that we're supposed to wrap up. Uh, thank you so much again, and congratulations and my very, very best wishes, Nan. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. I'm not. I'm not sure what's supposed to happen now. I think uh, Deepak will be joining us at this point in a few moments. There he is. Okay. Thank you, Joe and Christoph, for a very thoughtful questions. And I would like to now recognize the organizing committee who helped me, the continuous support who gave me, the associate professors Haim Bar and Yu Ping Zhang and Assistant Professor Yao Zain. The program coordinators, Juliet Katsis and Anne Hin for their dedication in seeing this colloquium come to fruition. Dr. Laird, on behalf of our sponsors and our guests, 
we would like to thank you for such inspirational uh, remarks. To honor your participation in this event, we have presented you a plaque with a recognition of your exceptional contributions to our field. Dr. Laird, Nan, would you like to say a few words? Yes, thank you so much, Deepak. First, I'll read to you the plaque that I've received. The Department of Statistics at the University of Connecticut is pleased to honor Dr. Nan M. Laird, Harvey V. Feinberg, Professor of Biostatistics Emerita, Harvard T.H. Chan, School of Public Health, at the 25th Pfizer slash ASA slash Yukon Distinguished Statistician Colloquium, October 14th, 2020. And then at the bottom, we have our sponsors, American Statistical Association, Pfizer, and University of Connecticut. So I, I'd like to say how very deeply pleased and honored I am to receive this award. And I'm especially grateful to uh, the sponsors, the ASA, and thank you, Ron, for your remarks. And Pfizer, thank you, Kanan, for your remarks and University of Connecticut. Thank you to Natisse for your remarks. They're very kind remarks, which I deeply appreciate. And I am especially grateful to Deepak. He has been throughout this time, very encouraging and enthusiastic and very kind and supportive. Um, and I also want to thank the team, the production team who helped us a great deal and to thank University of Connecticut for sponsoring this seminar and for the organizing committee. And finally, I also want to thank Joe and Christoph for participating with me. Thank you very much. Well, thank you again, Nan. Uh, of course, with our presentation, nothing would make sense. And you gave a great presentation. It's questions, answers, everything was so inspirational. I mean, I'm sure it's not only of current interest, but it will be carried over to future generation. Uh, thank you so much. And as a reminder, the recording of today's program will be available in approximately 24 hours from now. We'll send you an email with viewing instructions. Thank you again, once again, to our sponsor, Pfizer, AS, and Yukon for making this event possible. Thank you all for attending. I know people are attending from India, Brazil, Sweden, uh, Australia, and many other countries. And of course, the US, almost every state I noticed. So again, I think thank you all for a great, uh, Christoph, Joe, and then again for your tremendous contribution. Thank you.